There needs to be a focus on a, an immediate increase in spending. You're telling me we got to go spend money to keep from going bankrupt? The answer, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Okay, welcome back. And joining us now is Mr. Christopher Marola. Chris is a political consultant for Republican conservative candidates. He has a business, Red Momentum Strategies, and his website is redmomentum.com. And today we're going to be talking about the rise of fascism here in America. Chris, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, and uh, uh, good to talk to you again. Uh, yeah, I, I hey, found hey, an Chris, article. Pump up your volume a little bit. The volume is a little low? Yeah. Well, let me check. Go ahead. Talk. Okay. Uh, basically, I was saying that um, I, I saw an article from one of my favorite magazines, uh, townhall.com, and uh, this is one of my favorite online magazines. And uh, in it, there's an article called The Rise of the American Fascist State. And uh, basically what it's talking about is there is something known as the Foundation Series by Isaac Asimov. And this gentleman uh, talks about a mathematician named Harry Selden, who spent his life developing the branch of mathematics known as psychohistory. Now, psychohistory is using the laws of mass action to predict the future. And it's very accurate on a large scale, but not accurate on a small scale. Of course, that makes sense. You can't predict every nitpicky, trivial little thing that people are doing. But on a big scale, broad strokes, you can predict about every 70 years, according to this, this article, that there'll be a shift in the manner in which American politics is conducted. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is. All right. So let's talk about the rise of fascism in the United States. What example? And I can think of many examples, but you've got the article. What is this author pointing to? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it says how there's been a shift. For instance, uh, uh, if we start in 1789, which is the real beginning of the Constitution and, and all of that, we see a shift uh, seven years later to the beginning of the American Civil War, which I know you call the war between the states. So we see a big shift. No, I you know, call it the America. war of northern aggression. <laughs> okay, well, we see the shift where the states are coming together and they're agreeing, and then seven years later pulling apart and disagreeing. Uh, we see that uh, another example, another 70-year shift. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, actually had said uh, in 1896 that institutionalized segregation, racial segregation was legal. Seventy years later, uh, it was undone by, um, by the Congress in, in 1964. And I'd just like to emphasize a greater percentage of Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Bill of 64 to end segregation. A lot of Southern Democrats voted uh, in favor of segregation. So what we see is every 70 years, there seems to be a polar opposite shift in the direction that our political, um, you know, worldview takes. For instance, uh, it, it was 70 years ago in 1943 that we were fighting the fascism and we convinced uh, the Italians to rise up and overtake Mussolini, and then the Italians joined the United States uh, in fighting Hitler and fighting uh, Japan during World War II. Now, my family knows something about this because my parents were children in Italy during this period. In fact, it was in 1943 that the U.S. Army actually liberated my parents and their town from the Nazi occupation of that town, saving their lives. In fact, that would be next month, October of 1943, 70 years uh, ago. My parents, who were five years old and seven years old at the time, uh, were liberated uh, from the Nazis by the U.S. Army. Here we are 70 years later embracing some of those types of policies with the Obama administration at the helm the very policy 70 years ago that we fought against, we're now embracing here at home. 
Well, I think we can all agree that the uh, the the first glimpse of fascism we saw in this country came under Woodrow Wilson. So we have no disagreement there, right? Absolutely no doubt about it. That was 100 years ago, 1913, yes. Okay. I would argue that the second wave of fascism occurred under George Bush, 43, in this so-called war on terror. But Yeah, I wouldn't agree with that. Here's what I would agree with. I think the second wave of some type of fascist, socialist model came under FDR. Oh, oh, all right, I'll agree with you on the fa- uh, the socialism part uh, under FDR, and then if we're going to do that, let's go ahead and throw out uh, LBJ. LBJ. Uh, Richard Nixon would be an, another one, but but the whole police state, the, this whole Jimmy police Clark. state that we're living under. I know Bill Clinton got started with some snooping by the NSA, but it really kicked into full gear with the Patriot Act. And, and a lot of these other so-called war of terror pieces of legislation. Well, but the reason I can't make that blanket statement is because I think Bush showed some restraint, and he showed a certain amount of respect for the Constitution that Obama had absolutely no respect for the Constitution. I wouldn't call what Bush did fascism. I wouldn't call it um, totalitarianism. I, I would say he walked up to the line, maybe even crossed it a bit. But what Obama's doing is he doesn't even recognize that there's a boundary line. In Obama's thinking and in his worldview, the Constitution's meaningless. So I think Bush tried to work within the Constitution as much as he could. There may have been times that he didn't, and he should have. But he showed a certain amount of respect for America and for our, our Constitution and even for the founding fathers to a degree, that Obama has absolutely no desire to do. I, I, I don't think you can compare them. I, they're not that closely aligned. But getting back to fascism, this article says it describes fascism as a form of socialism with a capitalist veneer. So it gives the impression, fascism does, that it's capitalist in nature, but it's really just socialism. Oh, okay, and I agree with you there. What the distinction I was drawing was, I know fascism is government control, privately owned. We saw a prime example of that over in in Nazi Germany. Uh, what we have right. today is probably, well, the uh, GM takeover was clearly fascism. But uh, what we have here is a, is a kind of a blend of of socialism, crony capitalism, and a police state. Yeah, what we're doing is, what we're seeing people do is, each justifies their version of big government in different ways. I'm sure Bush thought he was protecting America, but when you allow uh, the government to have even just one step, even just one inch of ground, then it doesn't take much for a guy like Obama, the next generation or the next administration, to come along and say, forget just one foot in the door. We want to be completely in the door. So, you know, Bush may have thought, okay, we'll get a foot in the door and we'll hold it there. We won't go any farther. We'll keep government at bay at this point, at this boundary. But, you know, here we have Obama who says, what boundary? I don't need boundaries. I can do anything I want. So there clearly is a difference in in the way they operate. Now, the the way uh, this article describes everything, they said the word fascism derives from a Latin term called fasces. And that's the Roman symbol of collectivism and power. Well, that's the key word here, collectivism, which is where everybody is basically amalgamated into one, you know, prototype that is controlled by the state. You lose your individuality. You lose your creativity. You lose your uh, identity uh, for the sense of the state. It's collectivism, whether it's fascism, socialism, communism, Marxism, Chinoism, it doesn't matter. All of these isms fall under the umbrella of collectivism. It doesn't work, and all it does is squash and stifle the freedom, the independence, the creativity of the people. No argument there. Oh, absolutely. Now, check this out. Here's an argument they're making about how the government is seeking control of business. 
which is one of the facets of fascism. Uh, more than they're saying today, more than one third of the nation's highest paid CEOs in the last two decades led companies that were subsidized by American taxpayers. So we're all for the free market, you and I. We believe in running the business cycle and, and the business community run itself. Why do they need American taxpayers to subsidize them? Well, they don't, but that's the political system. And, and that, uh, for example, uh, the one fellow I was anxious to vote for the, the last presidential election cycle was Marco Rubio. And I really thought that he, he was going to be a, a game changer. But one of his very first votes was to maintain the subsidies, the sugar subsidies. And therefore, I mean, you know, we have the highest prices of sugar in in the world and it's because of that subsidy and so i that and then his amnesty bill i kind of have given up on marco rubio but uh, as disappointing as it is i wouldn't i'm not ready to give up because of two bad votes i mean he has done a lot of other things that were good and he is a very good speaker and he does speak well for the conservative movement my hope is people like that Rubio, uh, Tom Coburn, who are with us 80 to 90 percent of the time. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's not, because of two bad votes or three bad votes, get rid of them. This is what Chris, we got to go, do. buddy. Hard break. The, All right. We'll talk again. All right. We'll be back on the other side of the break. Inside. 